Hi, everyone. I thought I'd talk about Bitcoin and its technology. And it's really true. Um, it's important to understand the technology of Bitcoin and Ethereum. They're both on proof of work still, and they both use miners. And basically, that technology in the scheme of cryptocurrency technology, new technology, is way behind the curve now. So if we compare it to, say, XRP, which is a distributed ledger system technology, uh, it doesn't rely on miners, okay? And that's why the transaction costs are so cheap. So Bitcoin, I call the poster child because it was the first cryptocurrency to be launched in 2008, and it didn't start to really trade on the exchanges in 2009. So what I'm going to talk about specifically is Bitcoin and proof of proof of work uh, technology, okay? And and what exactly does that mean? P O W. So it's often, uh, you know, called P small O W proof of work. Now, Bitcoin, like Ethereum, has a lot of decentralized computers. Just think of them as computer terminals with a box all over the world, right? And they can be in any country in the world if you uh, are a miner and you basically mine Bitcoin with a full miner's license within the Bitcoin network. So all these computers are all over the world and there's roughly about more than 10,000 uh, computers all over, the, uh, all over the world and they're full node. So in other words, they're a Bitcoin uh, uh, station, if you want to call it that, where they have the, the Bitcoin hardware, they have the right computer with a nut, and they have nodes uh, which are also, full nodes are able to communicate to other nodes. So, uh, so there's obviously different computer resources that each of these full nodes would have. So if we look at China, for example, China has basically industrialized nodes and they've become the oligarchs of Bitcoin mining before the Chinese government closed down Bitcoin mining in China. So for example, every node they owned, or say they had 10 nodes, which were incredibly powerful uh, computers, which basically could calculate algorithms, you know, extremely fast because they had incredible technology uh, to support that, okay? And so they therefore had an incredible advantage to actually calculate uh, the, the algorithm, which, will, which I'll discuss, which is like a puzzle or a password, to actually... Uh, validate and then transact the Bitcoin, which I'll expect to, I'll explain a little bit further. So they had incredible computational power. And that computational power, if they own 10 nodes, they could potentially outsource to other computers with incredible grunt, using GPU graphics and all sorts of things in NVIDIA cards, which NVIDIA, by the way, has stopped those cards to miners because they're used for gaming. And so this incredible uh, competitive advantage with computational power enabled China to control 70% 70 or so of the Bitcoin hash rate, which is basically the computation rate. So, you know, the hash rate effectively is, uh, you know, how much computation they have to actually work out how to calculate the password, and you have a lot of people competing, right, uh, to, to work out that algorithm or the password. And the hash rate, you know, is very important because it's how much computer grunt and technology you have to, ca to calculate that, uh, that password, okay? So everyone is trying to solve the problem. And if you have a lot of people, clearly, that are trying to solve the problem, the mining or the validating of Bitcoin or, for example, before that, the calculation of the puzzle is going to be harder for you. So it's like we're all there, 10,000 or more of us, trying to work out a puzzle uh, in, in the network where we have to add zero or one because that's what computers understand, zero or one to transmit data. 
and everyone's trying to do the same thing at the same time, right? And obviously, uh, it becomes an incredible load on the network. So um, basically, what we've got is the hash rate is in the hands of oligarchs, right? And that's the biggest trouble with that. So, you know, effectively, because now China has got rid of the miners, it's basically the decline of the proof of work hash rate oligarchs, okay? And that's what we saw in China, which, you know, effectively was against the whole, uh, you know, ideology of Bitcoin. You know, Satoshi Moto wanted Bitcoin to be peer-to-peer with everyone, all the little people, not on an industrial uh, scale like China, okay? So, and that was the problem with NVIDIA, who produces gaming technology. They basically stopped it for the mining of Ethereum and Bitcoin. So that's why I've called this, uh, you know, decline of the proof, you know, the proof of work hash rate oligarchs, right? Now, you know, clearly when we talk about SHA-256, it's an algorithm, okay, and it's it's like calculating a puzzle or a password. There's many different types of algorithms. It could be, you know, uh, proof of stake, there could be proof of authority, you know, all sorts of things, right? Proof of ownership, whatever. And in that algorithm, you know, you have to calculate, you have to work out whether the next sequence or the chronological number, which is what a transaction is within Bitcoin, uh, is zero or one. Now, once what happens is, to explain this, you have raw data coming into the network of Bitcoin every time a transaction is done. And that raw data, say it's a thousand words, right? And... A thousand words is a thousand bytes, right? And with that raw data, it'll go through the Bitcoin uh, conversion, if you want to call it that, where it'll convert that raw data to a SHA-256. It'll convert a thousand words into 256 characters, chronologically and uh, sequentially. And that, you know, string of characters will have zeros and ones. As I said, that is how uh, data gets into into computers, right? And it's binary, one or zero. And also it'll have, you know, uh, uh, capital letters and small letters, and that will consist of 256 characters, which will basically be the equivalent of a thousand words, right? But also, 256 characters might be just one word. You see what I'm saying? And so every transaction will not be the same. And so what comes out, the 256 characters and numbers are going to be different for every transaction, okay? Now, when a miner goes through calculating the algorithm, which is just, you know, it's it's the SHA-256, right? Um, they will, you know, add one or zero and do it as fast as they can on their computational power of their, of their uh, technology. And that's why the Chinese had an advantage and it became absolutely centralised and, you know, oligarchs that controlled 70, 70-odd percent of the hash rate of Bitcoin. And the same with Ethereum, which is another story. So, um, basically, now what China's done is actually, I believe, philosophically, a very good thing for Bitcoin because it's going to make it more decentralised and for the little people, not the extreme wealthy oligarchs in China, Okay. And that's, you know, that's key because it is a philosophical problem. Now, once the data, the raw data, which is in zeros and ones, goes through the hash rate algorithm, right, it's effectively like, for example, think about it this way. The hash, once the data goes through, becomes a hash brown, okay? Now, the analogy is you've got a potato, okay, and you use that potato to make a hash brown, okay? 
So what it means is once the raw data has gone through and it's gone to 256 characters, you can't go back to the original data. So in other words, to put it in plain speak, you've got a hash brown, but you can't go back to the potato. Okay, I hope that makes sense, right? I know, I know it's a little bit, you know, hard to understand, but that's pretty much the story. So once uh, a miner has worked out the password and, you know, uh, won, won the transaction with the rewards of 6.25, also he gets the fees for the transaction, right? Uh, you know, basically that will get added to the block, okay? And obviously when the system is busy, that miner will be cherry picking for high fees if you want something processed and validated as priority. Now, if you a large client and you do a lot of Bitcoin and say you take, you know, you take up six blocks to do that. And like I told you, one block's got, you know, 3,500 to 4,300 uh, transactions, right? You know, if you're doing that many transactions, you're doing six blocks in the network of Bitcoin, that would take over an hour to produce. But assuming if you're doing like a buying a coffee and you, and also you don't know when it's going to settle, okay? Assuming if you're buying coffee and the system's quiet, nothing going on, not like the 19th of May, and you're paying enough in terms of fees for the miners, it should get processed a lot quicker. But again, the problem with Bitcoin is because it has to go through the miners and you don't know how busy the system is, you never know when it's going to be processed, transacted and confirmed, okay? And that's one of the problems. So that's why Bitcoin itself is a storage of value because you can't really use it because you never know when it's going to settle, okay? And on small transactions, it's very expensive because the Bitcoin fees has a set rate. And obviously, as the bit, the system gets busier and busier, that set rate goes up, okay, higher and higher. Now, you know, the blockchain itself is basically debits and credits, like an old, you know, accounting ledger, if you want to call it that. You've got money, you know, coin coming in and coin going out, okay? So... You know, but but in saying that everything's represented in in a one record, right? In terms of the SHA two five six. Now you could have millions of transactions coming in and out, and the beauty of this system of Bitcoin, its technology, is unbelievable, unbelievable, because what Natamoto created was just incredible. And, but he always wanted to be peer to peer, okay? So, you know, he didn't want, you know, the Chinese controlling, you know, 70% of the hash rate with full nodes, which are like the operational controllers of the system, uh, the oligarchs. And then they had their subsidiary modes that communicate with all the other nodes, uh, you know, in terms of just validating the transaction. So in a way, the system itself of the Bitcoin ledger is like uh, a global reconciliation system between all the different nodes and between the full nodes and the less, uh, the less, uh, the subsidiary nodes, if you want to call it that, okay? So, um, it, you know, it's very interesting just exactly how this happens, right? Uh, and... You know, when you, they're trying to calculate, obviously, the SHA-256 password, you know, it could be in the quadrillions, right? I mean, seriously, and that's a lot of digits, right? Zero, zero, one, one or whatever, right? And that's why, to mine Bitcoin, you need incredible techno technical power, operating power, because the oligarchs have made it that way, right? Now, if they weren't there the competition wouldn't be as severe, okay? Because in a way they're cheating. You know, they've industrialised Bitcoin mining on a scale 
that excludes all the small people, right? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, we won't go into double spend, but, you know, I hope, I hope that's clear and, you know, I'll add a bit more to this, uh, to this uh, as we go along. Anyway, thanks very much for listening and if you've got any questions, please do come back to me. Thank you.